It's now October 6, 2006, and the debut of the 40th expansion in Magic the Gathering history. With it comes a big ball of wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. Timey wimey? I've, I've no idea where he picks that stuff up. The theme of the entire block is time, and Time Spiral, the first set in the block, is all about the game's past. We're talking homages to old cards, old characters that are only just now getting physical cards, the return of a bunch of old keywords and mechanics, old frame cards making their debut in contemporary, modern, and standard, you get the idea. But before we get to that, let's talk a bit about Time Spiral, the story, which can be fully experienced by reading Scott Mago's novel of the same name. Hey there friends, it's your pal Orcish Librarian vlogging at you live from the year 2006. I'm recording this on my new Blackberry because somebody hacked my account on the Facebook, but oh my god, this phone is so cool, it has so many buttons on it. Anyway, I'll be back a little bit later in the video with some tidbits about Time Spiral. It's been 300 years since the Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria and the subsequent defeat of Yawgmoth. During those events, the powerful planeswalker and time mage, Teferi, phased parts of the world out of existence in an attempt to keep them from harm. This includes Teferi's home kingdom of Zulfir, as well as part of the continent of Shiv. Shiv, it seems, is returning back to the correct time stream and back to reality. Problem is, things have physically changed in the three centuries since the landmass has been missing and no longer fits into its rightful place. The friction being caused is threatening all of Dominaria. Teferi and his longtime friend, Jora, return to the plane to seek answers and aid because, being that Dominaria acts as a linchpin for all of the multiverse, it's not just one plane's existence being threatened, it's feasibly all of them. The duo first makes a stop in the Sky Shroud Forest, whereupon they learn that Dominaria is all but devoid of mana thanks to the massive temporal rifts that have opened in places across the globe, draining the land of its energy. One such rift is actually directly over Sky Shroud, and was caused when the Planeswalker Frailies successfully transplanted the forest onto the Keld region of the land during the invasion. Teferi asks Frailies, who acts as the forest's patron and protector, to assist him in investigating and repairing the rifts. Still angry at the time mage for what she feels is his abandonment of the plane during the invasion, the elven Planeswalker refuses. Regardless, Teferi begins to look deeper at the rifts. While doing so, he meets Rada, a half-elf who seems able to draw mana out of the rifts, similar to how the rifts draw mana out of the land. Determined to focus not on her elven side, but rather her Keldon warrior ancestry, Rada is not too keen to assist Teferi, despite the Planeswalker's godlike status and near-infinite power. Teferi, however, promises to teach her ancient Keldon knowledge in exchange for her assistance. The half-elf agrees, and, together, the group ventures into the dark continent of Urborg, intent on studying the stronghold that was overlaid there at the onset of the invasion, as well as the rift above it. On the island nation, the three encounter an Urborg native of interest. His name, they learn, is Vincer. He's an artificer who, his entire life, has lived under the rule of Lord Windgrace, a planeswalker with a keen disdain for artifice. In Vincer's company, Teferi notices that both the Artificer and the Half-Elf Rada contain within them Planeswalker Sparks, but that their sparks seem radically different from his own. The Time Mage's interest then gets drawn towards a strange device of the Artificer's creation. Vincer calls the device an Ambulator. Built from leftover parts from discarded Phyrexian artifacts, the machine essentially mimics the plane traveling ability that comes natural to planeswalkers by drawing upon the massive amount of mana that has been absorbed into the rift above Urborg. The Artificer fires the machine up, but the fairy's powerful presence conflicts with that of the Urborg rift, which has suddenly become erratic and violent. In an attempt to save his companions, the fairy planeswalks directly into the rift. The maneuver proved an unfortunate one, however, as instead of saving the group, they, too, are pulled in. Inside the rift, the group finds themselves falling through cracks within their reality, allowing them to witness various devastating events throughout Dominaria's history that caused the various temporal rifts to form in the first place, such as the activation of the Golgothian Silex at the climax of the war between the brothers Urza and Mishra, Corona's paradoxical existence on the island of Oteria, 
The obliteration of much of the island of Talaria, as well as the academy that once stood on its shores, and so on. They also see firsthand the locations of not just the rifts they're aware of, but also of six others. Then, everything abruptly stops. Rada, Vincer, and Jura awaken on a beach on Madara, an island nation far to the south of where they had just been. Teferi, however, is nowhere to be seen. That's when they are drawn into conversation with a mysterious disembodied voice. Introducing itself as Sensei Ryu, the voice tells the trio that it has noticed them tumbling through reality and pulled them to Madara for their own safety. Having earned their gratitude, Ryu then tricks Vincer and uses both his and Rada's latent sparks to appear before them in corporal form, though not in the form that any of them had expected. Ryu reveals himself to be Nicol Bolas, the extremely powerful and manipulative draconic planeswalker that had been imprisoned in limbo between the planes. Now reborn, the draconic planeswalker planned to, quote, reward Vincer and his traveling partners Rada and Jora for their assistance in his release. Were it not for Jorah's diplomacy and the sudden appearance of Teferi, who had found his way out of the rifts on his own, Bolas would have succeeded. Teferi challenged Bolas to a duel. His companions watched helplessly as Bolas easily defeated his opponent, getting into his head and tearing his mind apart. A dying Teferi shares his knowledge of the time rifts with Bolas and, realizing the severity of the issue, the dragon allows Teferi to live so that he may deal with the multiverse-threatening temporal rifts. Bolas then planes walks away, swearing vengeance on those who had tricked and imprisoned him to begin with. Rada then requests that Teferi allow her to go back to Keld. The weakened planeswalker dismisses her company, then takes the remaining members of their group, Vincer and Shuora, with him to Shiv. Back in Keld, Rada feels she now knows what she needs to do to become a true Keldon. In defense of the Sky Shroud Forest, she begins fighting against, and soon defeating, the Gothans illegitimate Kelds from the past that had been brought to the current times thanks to the time-altering rifts. With her victory, Rada found herself becoming the new Keldon Warlord and, in doing so, finds her connection switching from the rift above Shiv to the land of Keld. Teferi, noticing the change, attempts to forge his own connection with the Shivan Rift. With all his might and will, he channels everything he has into it, even his own life force intending to sacrifice himself if necessary, if it means closing the rift and ensuring Shiv's safety. To Teferi's credit, it works. The temporal rift above Shiv closes, and Shiv phases back into reality without incident, but not without cost. Teferi, a planeswalker with infinite power, is now anything but. As the Shiv and Rift closed, Teferi's planeswalker spark went with it, leaving the Time Age mortal and, despite all his talents, no longer a man of infinite power and capability. Thus ends the story of Time Spiral, but don't fret, there are still many more rifts to close and two more books to go before all is said and done. Hey, I'm back. Just so you know, just because the story summary is done doesn't mean that we're done talking about Time Spiral the set. And I should probably let you get back to it, but check out my page on GeoCities. Utilizing an hourglass as its set symbol, the 301 card time spiral was essentially a celebration of Magic the Gathering's past. As such, nostalgia plays a very big role as it brought back many creature types from previous sets and blocks such as Thalids, Slivers, Kavu, and so forth, as well as new incarnations of old cards. Nostalgia, however, was not the goal of the set. In fact, it just kinda sort of happened by accident. We didn't set out to have a nostalgia theme. Like when we started the block, it was about time. But once we got the idea of the past, it just, it kept popping up. Like the designers just kind of liked the idea of referencing Magic's past. Eight keyword abilities from Magic's past returned in Time Spiral, with some such keywords not having seen print since 1997. Buyback, Echo, Flanking, Flashback, Madness, Morph, Shadow, and Storm. Various old non-keyword mechanics also made the return, such as slivers, rebels, and whatnot. And there was also a cycle of cards that are callbacks specific to powerful cards from Magic's past. 
Known as the Magus Cycle, these creatures had abilities that mimicked those of Cursed Scroll, Nevenerl's Disc, Memory Jar, Mirror Universe, and Candelabra of Thanos. The Maguses, by the way, are just one of a whopping 20 cycles printed in Time Spiral, as well as being one of a handful that have callbacks to specific previously made magic cards. Another such cycle is the set's collection of buyback spells. Evangelize, which emulates the ability of the card Preacher from the Dark. Walk the Aeons, inspired by the original magic card Time Walk. Demonic Collusion, which is a spin on the card Demonic Tutor. Reiterate, which is essentially the card Fork, but with buyback. And Worm Calling, which owes its direct inspiration from the Odyssey card Ivy Elemental. We'll get to that third and final callback cycle in a moment, but before we do, we'd like to mention a few other notable card cycles found within Time Spiral. Spell Shapers, creatures with an activated ability that resemble that of a card from Magic's past, such as Ication Crier creating citizen tokens, which is itself an homage to the card Ication Town from Fallen Empires. Totems, uncommon artifacts that can tap for mana and also have a secondary ability that temporarily turns them into a creature on Magic the Gathering's reserved list, meaning that this will be the closest anyone will ever get to having a reprint of those original forms. An example being Phyrexian Totem, turning into a Phyrexian Negator. Two color legendary creatures from Dominaria's past, all of which are seeing a physical card for the very first time, such as Karavik the Merciless, who was the major antagonist during the Mirage storyline, and 20 different sliver creatures across five different mono and allied colored cycles. There were also a few cycles that feature the two, okay, technically three, brand new abilities that debuted in Time Spiral, Suspend, Split Second, and Flash. Suspend is an ability that provides an alternate way to play a card. With the ability, players pay a cost, then exile the card from their hand from the game with a specific number of time counters on it. In each of that player's upkeep steps, a counter is removed and, once the final counter is taken off, the spell resolves. Time Spiral boasts a cycle of rare spells, plus one artifact, Lotus Bloom, which was also the set's pre-release card, which feature the Suspend ability. Each card, in theory, is uncastable from the hand, because none of them have a mana cost, meaning that they are designed so that they have to be suspended in order to be cast, and, once they fire off, they mimic an effect of some of Magic the Gathering's most powerful early day spells such as the card Ancestral Vision, providing players with the same ultimate payoff as Ancestral Recall. When a card with Split Second is played, nothing else in the game is allowed to happen until that specific card's ability resolves. This essentially makes it impossible for a player to react to whatever the Split Second card is doing, so good luck trying to win the game with a top deck Lightning Bolt if your opponent has an Angel's Grace at the ready. An effective cat. As for Flash, which allows a card to be played at instant speed, even if it is not technically an instant card, well, it isn't really a new mechanic at all, as many of the cards in the past have had the ability, such as Alexei's Cloak and Prophecy, Vine Dryad and Mercadian Masks, and Ward of Light and Mirage, let alone other cards that granted the ability, like Weatherlight's Winding Canyons and the card Flash from Mirage, from which the ability gets its name. Here's something interesting. Suspend and Split Second weren't originally designed for Time Spiral, in fact, the latter one, Split Second, was originally being considered for Cold Snap, which was made alongside this set. Both key mechanics in the set, both Suspend and Split Second, both didn't come from the design. They came from other designs. So I think it was during Saviors of Kamigawa, they came up with the Suspend mechanic. Uh, I don't even know why, I don't know how they got to it, but they came up with it, uh, and I said to them, this is interesting, but I think it's bigger than just uh, a small set, you know, a third set mechanic. I go, this is the kind of mechanic we probably would do all year long. Also, Hybrid Mana, which had been introduced in the previous block with Ravnica City of Guilds, was briefly part of Time Spiral before being brought back to Ravnica. I think when design started for Time Spiral, um, in fact, uh, Ravnica had pushed out Hybrid. So I had brought Hybrid over to um, Time Spiral with the idea of there's temporal chaos and part of the temporal chaos was making hybrid mana. Anyway, Ravnik would, would borrow it back, we would lose it. 
But losing Hybrid Mana wouldn't really be a loss for Time Spiral, as the set still had more than enough going for it. In fact, Time Spiral isn't technically just one set, as there's actually a second, sort of subset if you would, known as Time Shifted Cards. Time Shifted Cards and Time Spiral is a collection of 121 pre-Mirrodin reprints that, unlike the rest of the set, appear in the original old card frame that the game had abandoned beginning with 8th edition in July of 2003. In fact, there's at least one card from every set and expansion released from the game's 1993 debut through Scourge, which came out in May of 2003. Time Shifted Cards have the old borders again? The new borders are barely three years old. It seems a little too early to get nostalgic. And they're an entirely different rarity? I hope they won't be as hard to get as Nickelback tickets. Wizards of the Coast even made sure to include one card that never actually came out in a set of its own. Arena. A card that was previously only available as a mail-in redemption offer with the Harper Prism Magic the Gathering books that came out in 1994. The idea, creative-wise, was that these cards were meant to reflect the temporal chaos afflicting Dominaria, and that it wasn't just the story that the chaos was affecting, it was the cards themselves. Each pack of Time Spiral included one time-shifted card and, with the exception of a few aesthetic differences here and there, were more or less exactly the same as their original printings, save for the set symbol which, this time around, was a special purple-colored hourglass, and having formatting being updated to match the current standards. Though, there is one time-shifted card that technically has new artwork. Consecrate Land is a card from Magic's original run in August of 1993. As with a number of the card arts from that time, Wizards of the Coast no longer had a copy of the original artwork set aside for future use. As such, the company contacted the original artist, Jeff A. Minges, who painted as close to an exact copy of his original artwork as he could. And it's that new version of the artwork that actually appears on the time-shifted version of Consecrate Land. Also, the time-shifted card Void Mage Prodigy uses artwork not from its Onslaught original printing, but rather the version given out as a promo in 2003. As for the full assortment of time-shifted cards, they ran the gamut from the nostalgic to the obscure and the powerful to the laughable. One of the reasons bed cards are important is you need to have something like, you need low lows for high highs. So we knew on the bonus sheet that we needed you to have things you literally would not expect us to print. Uh, I think Cyanic Blaston and being like the holy moly, I cannot believe they printed this. Um, and the absolute end of the spectrum was Squire. And I, I mean, we knew Squire was bad. We knew Squire was a horrible card. It was bad on purpose. You know, now, I mean, Oratog was, was on the bonus sheet as well. That is a, you know, 1W, 1W with an ability. So clearly we were aware that it was bad, you know, but we needed the range. We wanted you to, who knows what was going to happen? Who knows what you could get? And what could you get? Well, between the normal time spiral cards and the time shifted ones, there were plenty. Academy Ruins, which is a representation of the old destroyed Tolarian Academy, and features an ability inspired by the card Volrath Stronghold. It's a popular card in Mono Blue Tron decks and a key piece in Magic's Mind Slaver lock combo. Ancestral Vision, an inexpensive to cast and fairly popular card draw spell. Ancient Grudge, a quality anti artifact spell with flashback. Dread Return, which is often found in Reanimator decks. Empty the Warrens, one of a number of solid win conditions for Storm decks. Gemstone Caverns, a card designed by Tsuyoshi Fujita, winner of the 2005 Magic Invitational, and one of four Invitational cards to make it into the set, with the time-shifted cards Avalanche Riders, Shadow Mage Infiltrator, and Void Mage Prodigy joining it. Crossing Grip, still a popular and powerful sideboard card. Lotus Bloom, essentially a black lotus with suspend. The card can often be found in Storm decks and is also rather popular in ADH. Smallpox, a variation of the Ice Age card Pox, and a must include in Legacy and Modern Pox decks. Teferi, Mage of Zulfir, which represents Teferi after losing a spark to the Shivan Rift. Popular in control decks at the time, Teferi saw a good amount of tournament play and combos very well with the card Mystical Teachings, also found in Time Spiral. Dragonstorm, a card that was all but ignored when it debuted in Scourge a few years prior, but became quite popular thanks to the printings of Lotus Bloom and Bogarden Hellkite. 
and Tormod's Crypt, a still very popular sideboard option against graveyard strategies. This time-shifted reprint was the first time the card received a reprint since Chronicles in 1995. And there are, of course, a number of cards that are callbacks to some of Magic's earliest days, such as, for example, the legendary land Kerr Keep, which is a direct reference to the Legends card Kobolds of Kerr Keep and Rogah of Kerr Keep. Rift Bolt, which is a lightning bolt with suspend. Sephardian Empires, Volume 7, which refers to the flavor text found on a number of different cards from the set Fallen Empires. The artifact can also create the various token creatures found within that set. And Sprite Noble, which is essentially a color-shifted version of the Homelands card Fairy Noble, seeing as the fairy creature type had been mostly moved into blue from green. Really, there are just so many to list that one can easily spend another 10 or 20 minutes on the subject, which we will not be doing here. The amount of things going on in the set, however, would prove to be Time Spiral's biggest black mark. Simply put, while most longtime Magic players loved it, many newcomers and novice players found it a bit too robust. And it's in that regard that some at Wizards of the Coast found the set to be a bit of a bust. The idea was, well, if you know Magic's history, well, this won't be so hard. But we did not take into account kind of the complexity, you know. And, and I talk about how myst mistakes are important because Time Spiral just bowled people over like, what? What's going on? Ah, brain hurt, brain cramp. You know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't get it all. This is the funny thing. I talk about Time Spiral was a failure. Whenever I do, I get all these people out of the, coming out of the woodwork getting really mad at me. And they're like, that was the best set you guys ever made. That was the best block you ever made. How dare, how dare you say anything bad about it? And the reality is, it's not that it was a bad block. I look, it's one of my favorite blocks. I enjoy it immensely. I enjoyed making it. I enjoyed playing it. If I was trapped on a desert island and I could only play one block for the rest of my days, I'd probably pick Time Spiral block. That block has a lot going on. There's a lot of fun stuff. The complexity that's a negative for a lot of players is a positive for me. Hey, y'all, back one last time. Is Time Spiral one of your favorite sets? Whether it is or isn't, leave a comment and tell us your thoughts. Uh, that's it for me. I gotta go try to get tickets to the second Pirates of the Caribbean movie starring the non-problematic Johnny Depp. Boy, there's a franchise that won't wear out its welcome. And be sure to subscribe to Magic Untapped here on YouTube and support us by tossing a buck in the Magic Untapped tip jar on Patreon. Thank you for watching.